Today, I'd like to uh, bring the reading of God's Word to you from 2 Kings chapter 5. Uh, my name's Caleb, and my son Will will be reading the other part with me. I'm reading from the NIV version. 2 Kings chapter 5. Now Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. Now bands of raiders from Aram had gone out and taken captive a young girl from Israel and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, if only my master would see the prophet who was in Samaria, he would cure him of leprosy. Naaman went to his master and told him what the girl from Israel had said. By all means go, said the king of Aram. I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left, taking with him 10 talents of silver 6,000 shekels of gold and 10 sets of clothing. The letter that he took to the king of Israel read, With this letter I am sending my servant Naaman to you, so that you may cure him of his leprosy. As soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his robes and said, Am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send me, send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? See how he is trying to pick a fight with me. When Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him this message. Why have you torn your robes? Have the man come to me, and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. And so Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to say to him, Go, wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored, and you will be cleansed. But Naaman went away angry. And said, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over the spot and cure me of leprosy. Are not Abana and Farfar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went off in a rage. Naaman's servant went to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then when you, he tells you to wash and be cleansed? So he went down and dipped himself into the Jordan seven times, as the man of God had told him. And his flesh was restored and became clean, like that of a young boy. Then Naaman and all his attendants went back to the man of God. He stood before him and said, Now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. So please accept a gift from your servant. The prophet answered, as surely as the Lord lives, whom I serve, I will not accept this thing. And even though Naaman urged him, he refused. If you will not, said Naaman, please let me, your servant, be given as much earth as a pair of mules can carry, for your servant will never again make burnt offerings and sacrifices to any other god but the Lord. But may your Lord forgive me, your servant, for this one thing. When my master enters the temple of Rimon to bow down, and he is leaning on my arm, and I have to bow down there also. When I bow down in the temple of Rimon, may the Lord forgive your servant for this. Go in peace, Elijah said. Elisha said. 
After Naaman had travelled some distance, Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said to, him, said to himself, My master was too easy on Naaman, this Aramean, by not accepting from him what he brought. As surely as the Lord lives, I will run after him, and I will get something from him. So Gehazi hurried after Naaman. When Naaman saw him running toward him, he got down from his chariot to meet him. Is everything all right? he asked. Everything is all right, Gehazi answered. My master sent me to say, two young men from the company of the prophets have just come to me from the hill country of Ephraim. Please give you them a talent of silver and two sets of clothing. By all means, take two talents, said Naaman. He urged Gehazi to accept them and then tied up the two talents of silver in two bags and two sets of clothing. He gave them to two of his servants and they carried them ahead of Gehazi. When Gehazi came to the hill, he took the things from the servants and put them away in the house. He sent the men away and left, and they left. When he went in and stood before his master, Elisha, asked him, Where have you been, Gehazi? Your servant didn't go anywhere, Gehazi answered. But Elisha said to him, Was not my spirit with you when the man got down from his chariot to meet you? Is this the time to take money or to accept clothes? or olive groves and vineyards, or flocks and herds, or male and female slaves. Naaman's leprosy will cling to you and to your descendants forever. Then Gehazi went from Elisha's presence, and his skin was leprous. It had become as, wh as white as snow. Scared to speak. No, we're okay. Thank you, Caleb. Thank you, Will. Uh, and thanks, Shabu, for taking us through chapter four last week. I have a feeling that we're going to have some eight. Let's okay. Early intervention. We're turning this off. And it's already on? Fantastic. Okay. So my name's Andy. I'm not an AV tech. Uh, in fact, I'm not an anything kind of tech this week because even my PowerPoint's had a bit of a fail. So I've got a photo printed to show you in a second. <laughs> uh, let's, let's pray and let's pray that God's word will speak regardless of everything else. God, we ask that we would hear you speaking through your word uh, and that it is your word that has something to say to us. Uh, has something to say to us today. Uh, may we examine our hearts and may they be, our hearts be soft so that they can be shaped by what you have to say to us. And we pray that in the name of Jesus. Amen. Last week, Shabu talked to us out of chapter 4 and, and we saw God providing. We saw God providing for a debt to be repaid, you know, and their acts... Um, fell in and they had to, he was going to have to pay it back if, if the axe didn't float. Uh, we saw the lady, um, the, the filling of the jars with oil. Uh, we saw God's provision for a life even to be resurrected. And in some ways we're still looking at the way that God provided through the work of Elisha and chapter 5 is a continuation uh, of that. It keeps going. Uh, we see that God has compassion for people we see his compassion expressed here in chapter 5. We see people who, humanly speaking, are successful, but they've got needs that only God can provide for. 
same thing happened last week. Uh, we see a God who knows, we see a God who hears, we see new life being given, we see God alone being the provider. But there are some key differences here that I want you to see, and they're going to matter to us. Because in chapter 4, God's miraculous provision was being made for people who came from Israel. They were God's people, and they regarded themselves as such. This time, God's miraculous provision is being made for someone really unexpected. He's a foreigner. And he's not just a foreigner. He's, he's like a guerrilla warlord. He, he crosses the border and he raids Israel and he takes stuff. He even takes people. We would call this guy a terrorist, maybe a human trafficker. In chapter 4, last week, we saw that the people in Israel, they knew to turn to God. When they, were, they, when they had problems, they went to Elisha and they said, help. In chapter 5, it seems that even the king of Israel didn't know where to turn to. He got a letter and he just went, ugh. In chapter 4, last week, we saw uh, that those who are perceived as far from God were seeking him. Uh, sorry, in this chapter, those who are perceived as far from God are seeking him. And those who are perceived as close to God are not seeking him. And so we see different hearts on display. Uh, we can see the heart of the servant girl serving Naaman. We see Naaman's heart on display. We see the king of Israel's heart on display. And we see Gehazi, the servant. We see his heart on display. And so we're going to talk about the heart. And we're going to talk about three things. And, and there are going to be three sections of this chapter. First of all, verses 1 to 9, we're going to look at the fact that God calls every heart. God calls every heart. Then verses 10 to 18, we're going to look at what God does to Naaman, and we're going to see that God humbles every heart. And then in verses 19 through 27, we're going to see that God knows every heart. Nothing is hidden from him. There is a whole lot of unexpected stuff in this chapter. Uh, not necessarily unexpected to you and I. It's the Bible. We just read it and we go, that's interesting, that's nice. But for the original reader, a lot of this stuff was re leaping off the page and slapping them in the face and saying, pay attention, look at this, this is not normal. And those things are there on purpose. And it'll be useful for us to reflect just Take two seconds to reflect, why was this book written? It was written because the people of Israel had been ripped out of the promised land by enemy nations. They've been taken away into Babylon and they are asking themselves some big questions. What happened? God told us he was going to give this land and we'd be here forever and now we're not there. How did we end up here? What happened to God's promises? Were they ever real? Is God really in control? Because it doesn't look like he is. Is there even any hope at all? Those questions are worth keeping in your mind as we read the king's full stop, but particularly as we look at this chapter. So let's look at the first section, verses 1 through 9. And like any good movie, uh, the plot moves location and we leave... Uh, Elisha and the prophets in Israel, in that northern part of uh, the kingdom, and we get zoomed off to some, uh, Syria, also known as Aram, the kingdom of Aram. Uh, where is that? If you're looking at the map, I would have had it up here for you if I was a techie person. Uh, oh, it's there! Hey! Okay, I'm not the techie person. Someone else uh, is there. Okay, you can see it there. The kingdom of Aram, also known uh, as Damascus, uh, there they are up there in the northeast. Uh, and we get introduced to this guy called Naaman. Naaman is commander of the king's army in the kingdom of Aram. Uh, he's not going to be popular with the readers of the book of Kings because the Aramean army would periodically come down across the border, and the border is effectively the river Jordan, 
They would cross the border and they would raid Israelite towns and villages. They would take their crops, their people, their livestock, so on. And Naaman was the leader of some of these raids. He's the, he's the chief of the army that carries out these raids. Not only is he the leader of the army, he has himself profited from this activity. He's got a servant girl. How nice. She's probably an orphan after her parents were killed in the raid. Uh, and so the readers are going to say, yeah, I know how that girl feels like because I also got ripped out of my country, taken to a foreign place, and those who loved me were, sorry, those who I loved around me have been killed. Straight away, we've got an affinity between the reader and this servant girl. But then we get slapped in the face with a few of the unexpected things. First of all, did you notice in verse 1, we are told Naaman is a, a mighty man and he had victory in his battles. Why? Because the Lord had given victory to Aram. The Lord has given victory to Israel's enemy. This is an important side note for these people who are reading this. They're being told, hey, nobody gets victory without God giving it to them. Nobody. God was exercising his sovereign will in handling victory then to the Aramean raiders. He had given them victory in the battles that they had undertaken. God was exercising his sovereignty to arrange for this Hebrew servant girl to be in this house at this time. God was controlling things all the way back then. And now when the people are sitting in Babylon, their lives seem completely hopeless. Their nation has fallen apart. They're not even a nation anymore. They're just a nothing. And they're looking at this story and they're saying, God had a plan then. God did control stuff then. Maybe he still is able to control things now. That should deliver some comfort to the first-time reader. It can deliver us comfort today too. God does exercise his sovereign hand over things that we don't see or understand. We, it looks like things are so often falling apart and yet God is still in control. He is working out a big master plan. The second thing that leaps off the page as unexpected is that the servant girl, you see her heart of compassion for her master. Now, I don't know all of you, but if I was this servant in this house and I found out my master had leprosy, I would say, ha! <laughs> Suffer in your jocks. He, and he probably did. I would want him to suffer. I would. I just would. Because he has caused me to suffer and he's caused others to suffer. And I reckon that's, again, that's how the Israelites would have felt sitting in Babylon, having been ripped out of their, their promised land, and they would want the Babylonians to suffer. God, I can just hear them praying this, God, when you get around to it, make them suffer. I would want my captors to be tormented. Leprosy or, or any other kind of condition. I could think of a few worse ones. I mean, that's what they deserve, isn't it? That would be fair. And you and I want everyone to get what they deserve, don't we? Don't we? Actually, I saw a few people say, oh, no. <laughs> no, I don't. You know what? I, on reflection, I don't. I don't. Because when justice will vindicate me, that's when I want justice. And when justice would convict me, that's when I want mercy. I have a self-serving view of justice and when it should be given out. So did the Israelites. So do we. The third unexpected thing that jumps off the page is that we're introduced to this notion, this possibility, confronting as it is, that an enemy of God and God's people might call on the one true God. He might seek out the one true God. Because in order to seek healing from Elisha, Naaman has to come into Israel, not in war, but in peace. 
And so the message underlying this notion is that God is not just the God of Israel. God is the God of all people, all nations. The whole planet is his and he wants them all to come. God calls all people to worship him. And so Naaman, he goes to the king of Aram. He gets permission to go and he even gets a letter. Uh, and, he, and he goes to the king and he goes bearing gifts. Uh, these gifts are an effort to motivate the king of Israel to do what he's being asked to do. And these gifts are not small. They're very motivating. Uh, I calculated the amounts of silver in today's money. Uh, it's pretty good. $375,000 worth of silver. And guess how much in gold? Six million dollars worth of gold. Would that motivate you? That would make me think hard about whether I could arrange a healing. Uh, <laughs> plus, plus, there's ten sets of clothes. And depending where you shop, that's also a lot. Right? That could also motivate you uh, to get ten outfits. And he goes off with this letter. I've, I put the letter into a uh, modern language uh, translator, and here's what the letter might have said. Dear King Jehoram, we probably think that that's who what, there was the king in Israel at the time. Dear, dear King Jehoram, I hope this finds you well and that your people are enjoying peace and prosperity. With this letter, I'm sending my servant Naaman to you that you may cure him of his leprosy. I trust that our previous military exchanges can be put aside for the sake of international relationships and goodwill. Kind regards, your friendly neighbour, the King of Aram. P.S. I would consider it a personal rejection and a national provocation if Naaman was to return still with leprosy. <laughs> this is certainly how the King of Israel has taken it. And I want you to notice a few things. There's something kind of ironic in this letter. There, it's, it's to the point of being funny. It's not the assumption that you can bring gifts and swap it for a healing or that you can just sweep old wars under the carpet. Uh, that's been done plenty of times before. It's this assumption that outside of God's kingdom, they think, well, if there is such a powerful God in Israel and they've got prophets of this God, where would you find these prophets? They'd be in the palace. It would be a no-brainer. You would have them in the king's palace but nothing could be further from the truth in Israel. What seems obvious to those outside of the kingdom, inside the kingdom, is the complete opposite. The kings of Israel hated the prophets. They hated them. They persecuted them. They killed them. They literally hunted them down so they could put them in prison. And so we have the king of Israel who's been persecuting and rejecting the message of the prophets and the God they represent, and they, he gets a neighbour writing to him saying, how good would it be to have a God and a prophet like this? Could I ask you a favour from one of them? And the commentator is seen to be making this sort of deliberate between the lines point. He's making a statement. Look, he says, look to the people of Israel, look at them. Blinded by their own sin, they rejected the prophets. When everyone else around them could see that it was worth listening to a God like this, everyone else could see that it made perfect sense and blinded by their own sin, the Israelites themselves had rejected it. The second thing I want you to notice is the reaction of the king of Israel when he gets this letter. He reads the letter... He doesn't make a plan. He reads the letter and he panics. Am I God? What, what kind of thing is this to ask? He thinks he's being set up. He, he literally thinks that he's only got two options. To try, like take the money and the, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a decent take. Take the six million dollars, take the silver, take the clothes, try and fail and then you've taken someone's money and you've given them nothing in return. That's offensive. Or to say, no, no, I won't. You know, there's someone else, uh, it occurred to me this morning, there was someone else in Scripture who was presented with a similar dilemma when Joseph was hauled out of prison to tell Pharaoh his, the meaning of his dreams. 
And Joseph, uh, and they say, hey, Joseph, we understand that you can interpret dreams. He says, no, I can't. But God does. God can. This is the point that the king of Israel has missed. He thinks it's, he thinks it's all up to him. So again, it's drawing our attention to the fact that the king knows who God is, and he knows that only God can do it, but you notice what he doesn't do. He doesn't turn. He doesn't turn to God. He doesn't seek out the prophet. It's almost like he's hardened his heart so much that that has just gone off the option list. It's not even something that he thinks of anymore. And again, to the readers who are reading this, sitting in exile in Babylon, the writers of the king is answering the question, how did we get here? I'll tell you how we got here, says the writer. Look at who's turning to God and look who's not. Look who's turning to God and look who's not. Exiles and foreigners were seeking God, but the king of Israel was not. That's how we got here. You and I can be reminded as we look at these verses that God calls every heart to turn to him. God calls every heart to to turn to him. And although it sounds really obvious and you just want to say, yeah, yeah, Andy, duh, that's, that's, a, that's an obvious statement. I wonder if you and I can see ourselves in this picture. You know, God calls those people who we don't expect. I confess to you that there are people in my life, even today, who I know need to hear the gospel and I think to myself, why bother? They're like a Naaman in my mind. Why bother? They're like the enemy. They're the last person who would ever accept the gospel. But that is not for me to decide. That's like me playing judge. It's not for me to decide who will respond and who won't. It's for me to speak up and to say to them, hey, if only you would turn to Jesus, he can make a difference. It is for me to share the amazing news of the gospel and let God do the heart work. I wonder if there's... Uh, some of you who you feel like life has dealt you a difficult blow. God also calls your heart to turn to him. Can you accept, like the Hebrew servant did, that God is still in control? God is still God, even though you can't see everything that he's up to, even though it might not make sense to you. Are we willing to turn our heart towards God and allow him to influence the attitudes that we have to our own circumstances or the attitudes we have to those who have wronged us and harmed us. Sometimes when I think about those people that I find hard to love, I pray to God and I say, God, can you do something about them? And actually what I really need is for God to do something about my heart towards them. If you're a long-time follower of Jesus, What an amazing privilege it is to bring our challenges and our questions before God. And so I I want to say to you, in reality, so often I don't do this. I see myself like the king of Israel. You get a big whopping challenge laid in front of you and you just go, I'm panicking. I don't know what to do. All of my options seem crazy and I'm stuck. So often I look at my own challenges and maybe you do too. You look at them and you say... This is not possible. Why? Because I'm assessing everything against what I can do. But God doesn't call us to fix the problems. God calls us to turn our hearts towards him. Bring it to him. The response to life's challenges are not for me and me alone. They're not for you and you alone. They are for God. God calls your heart. He wants you to bring them. And that's exactly what Elisha does. He hears the panicky response of the king and he sends for Naaman. And he says, why are you falling apart, King Jehoram? Send Naaman to me. And so we move on uh, into verses 10 through 18. And we're going to see that God humbles every heart. I want to tell you a story about a guy called Booker T. Washington. (laughs) I guess he's American. Um, Booker T. Washington, he was a renowned black American educator. This guy is seriously uh, at the high end of society. He is an advisor to US presidents in the late 1800s. 
And he was out walking one day in a pretty exclusive part of town. He's a black guy and he's stopped by a wealthy white woman. And not knowing who on earth he was, she says to him, young man, would you like to earn yourself a few dollars? She invites him to come chop her wood. I wonder how he will react. Well, he has no pressing business. So Professor Washington rolls up his sleeves and proceeds to humbly do the chore that she has requested. He chops the wood, he carries the logs into the house and he stacks them by her fireplace. And just on his way out, a young girl in her house recognises Professor Washington. And after he's left, she tells the lady of the house the bad news. And the next morning, the embarrassed woman goes to his office at the institute that he worked at and she apologises profusely. And he says, that's all right, madam. Occasionally, I enjoy a little manual labour and it's always a delight to do something for a friend. Naaman is a big man. He expects someone to know who he is. He is sent by one king to another king. At home, he serves the king. He is known. He is famous. Everybody knows Naaman. He's accustomed to being treated according to his status. But now he's not being treated according to his status. He's being now sent away from the palace to go to Elisha's house. And when he arrives, we don't get the, the, the sort of nitty-gritty detail in the text, but what we do get gives us a bit of a hint. When he arrives, there is no delegation. There's no welcome dinner, there's no feet washing, there's no recognition of Naaman's importance. In fact, there's not even an Elisha, the prophet that he's sent to, he's not there. The prophet doesn't show up. This is a person with a message from the prophet. Go wash yourself in, this, uh, in the Jordan seven times and your flesh will be restored and you'll be cleansed. Okay, obviously his, his request uh, had got, gone ahead of him. And I can kind of imagine the door creaking open just enough for Gehazi, most likely, to stick his head through the gap and say, Elisha says go wash in the river seven times. And the door closes again. And he leaves Naaman standing on the doorstep, all the six million dollars of gold in the wagon behind him. And he's just like, what happened? It feels like Elisha is being deliberately rude, and I expect he may have been. Not because this is uh, a scripture about hospitality, but because God was trying to draw Naaman down off his high place and say, hey, this is actually not about you, Naaman. This is not how big you are. Now, this is where I get my little picture out. I forgot already about the slides. Okay. <laughs> okay. This, this looks like a drain to me. Uh, this is actually the River Jordan. Um, and I don't know uh, if this was, if this photo is taken from the place, you know, I don't know if this is the border between uh, Israel and, and Syria or Aram. Uh, I don't know if this is what it looks like in that particular particular part of the world, but this is the River Jordan. Uh, and apparently the River Jordan was not really known as a washing kind of river, right? You wouldn't go there for clean water. Uh, going, going with leprosy and being told to wash in the River Jordan is a little bit like having a tummy bug and being told to go drink out of the Yarra in Melbourne. Uh, seven cups. <laughs> it kind of doesn't make sense. And Naaman's not only famous, Naaman is proud. And Elisha has touched a nerve. He's left him standing on the doorstep and being told to go and do something ridiculous. It's too easy and it's almost too silly. And for the sake of time, I just want to tell you that Naaman is being asked to humble himself. And I want to tell you four ways in which Naaman is being humbled. He comes before God and he's, God says to him, 
Naaman, you can come, but you must have the right posture. Don't come here on your high horse. First of all, Naaman is not acknowledged as anyone great. In fact, before, you, before God, you and I, nobody. Not you, not me, not anyone is great. Only God is great. And so when we come to God, we don't come with merit. We don't come with status. We actually come with only one thing. It's an incurable condition, just like Naaman. Naaman, Naaman was being showed that before God, he comes with nothing. He comes with nothing. He had nothing to offer. He had no standing, no status, no right to negotiate. He needed to be shown that the only thing he brought was an in curable condition, nothing else. Naaman also had expectations that needed to be reset. And that's the second thing that God does for him. Naaman says, well, I expected gestures and loud callings out. I expected a bit of a show. Waving hands over my body. But instead of having his expectations met, Naaman was asked to do something that he felt was beneath him. Go wash in the Jordan. It's almost like God saying, hey, I'm not here to meet your expectations. You're here to meet mine. I'm the king of the universe, remember, Naaman? Naaman's still not comfortable. What if, if water's going to be the thing, at least can I wash in a nice river? We've got good rivers back at Damascus. But God is showing Naaman that he's not in, his, in any position to put his expectations onto God. When we come before God, we can't project our expectations again. God, I imagine a good God would do this. God, I imagine that if you were really God, you would do that. I've prayed those prayers. I've been that person. But when we come before God, we can't place our expectations onto him. He's not obliged, and it seems that he's not even inclined to bow to your expectations the unchanging God does not change for you. He doesn't change for me. What he wants is for us to discover who he already is. And so we don't come announcing our preconceived ideas and hoping God fits. We come saying, God, help me to see what you are actually like. God wants us to discover what he's already like, not to try to fit into your mind's picture. The third thing, in conversation with his servants, Naaman realises, yeah, you know what, if he had asked me to like run seven laps of the house at, you know, under three minutes, he would have tried. But Naaman would have done something hard if it could give him the ticket out of this condition of leprosy. And his servant's saying, well, Naaman, if you would have done something hard, should you not try something easy? It's not hard. To wash in the Jordan? Yeah, it's humbling. Yeah, it's silly. Um, it's simple. Naaman was being shown that there was, no, there was never going to be any earning here. I don't know about you, I find myself so often wanting to find a way to do something and share the credit with what God has done. Or to do something and sort of deserve what God has done for me after the fact. But Naaman's being shown that the credit will go to God and God alone for the curing of this uncurable disease. You and I need so often to be reminded of this fact. There is no taking credit for what God's forgiveness has delivered us. There is no sharing the credit in what God's work has done. It is not achieved by human effort. It is simply by trusting in what Jesus has done. It seems too simple for us. It seems too easy. It almost seems silly to some of us and say, surely I have to, I have to change my life. I have to quit those things and, and have to be a better person and, and then I'll deserve it. Then I'll, then I'll have taken some steps myself towards earning God's favour or earning God's salvation. And God says, no. It's not you. It's Jesus who did it. And so the fourth thing is, when Naaman finally humbles himself enough to go wash in the river and be cleansed, he realises what has been done for him and he goes back to Elisha. And what does he do? 
He insists on making payment. He insists on making payment. He wants to square the ledger with Elisha. Once again, God knows that Naaman needs to be humbled. And so how much money does Elisha take? None. Absolutely none. Elisha is firm. There is no payment that can be made for God's grace. Can you imagine if Elisha had accepted, how much would be the right amount? What prices do you put on the, on the leprosy healing? Is it the full 6.375 million? Or is it less? Is the leprosy only worth 4 million? Paralysis may be worth 5. Can you, see the, can you see how crazy this is? You're trying to put value on what God does? You're trying to give it a price tag? Elisha made sure that Naaman was brought to the right response. And his right response was worship, not payment. Worship. You and I cannot balance the ledger with God. And so Naaman departs deciding that he will only worship the God of Israel. In fact, so determined is he to worship the God of Israel that he wants to take a bit of Israel with him. He wants to take Israel dirt in a whole bunch of bags, as much as his donkeys can carry, and take it back into Aram. His theology needs a little work. Um, someone has wisely described the, the door to the kingdom as one that is always lower than where you stand. You have to bow to enter. The door to the kingdom of God is lower than you stand. You must bow to enter. God humbles every heart. I don't know whether you've been a Christian a long time, a short time, or yet to decide whether you will follow Jesus. But let me tell you some good news and bad news. The good news is that you can bring nothing to God in exchange for your salvation. It is a free gift completely unmerited. You can't qualify for it. God already loves you. That's great news. But the bad news is the same as the good news. You can bring nothing. It is so humbling. It is a free gift, completely unmerited. You can't earn it in advance. You can't pay for it afterwards. You bring nothing. And I don't know about you, but when someone does something amazingly good for me, there's a little part of me that says, this is not politeness, this is I want to do something back. Why? Because I'm not so low and I'm not so small that I can do nothing in return. I'm not that small. I'm not that powerless. I'm not that low. But when it comes to God and my heart condition, I am that low. I am that small. I am that powerless. The Bible tells us that the best of our efforts, and sometimes the best of our human efforts, look really good. But the best of our efforts look like filthy rags. And that's why we need Jesus. Let us go to Gehazi. This is Elisha's servant. And now we see God knows the heart. The writer gives us another unexpected twist. Naaman's heart has been humbled and changed. He wants to worship the one true God. He even seeks forgiveness for the times that he enters the false temple of a false god with the king. And he says, hey, I just want you to know I've got this role and I have to go into a temple, but I'm not bowing my heart. And Elisha says, go in peace. But Gehazi's heart, wow, it is not humble or soft. It is proud and it is hard. Gehazi is judgmental. He's racist. He thinks Elisha was too easy on Naaman. And he's decided he is going to set the record straight. He will make Naaman pay. He even takes an oath. As surely as the Lord lives, I, Gehazi, will make this right. Who's playing judge now? And so Gehazi catches up with him and he spins a lie to Naaman. And his lie is very clever. It's actually really calculated. If he had said, Elisha has changed his mind, he wants the full 6.375 million, Naaman would surely know something's up. But Gehazi says, oh, we've just had a couple of guys arrive. We need money and we need clothes. Two sets is fine. And just one talent of silver is enough. 
And Naaman, notice Naaman's response. You've asked for one? Hey, take two talents. I'll give you more. Naaman's response is typical of someone touched by God's grace. But Gehazi, on the other hand, his behaviour is typical of someone who is blinded again by his own sin. Because not only is it all lies, there is no visitors, there's no need for money or clothes. But he expects that the God who can heal leprosy wouldn't find out. Again, sitting outside, we're looking in. This kind of seems crazy, doesn't he? How is it that the God who could heal leprosy would somehow not know what Gehazi's been up to? We've seen this happen before too. Do you remember when Jeroboam, the king uh, in the northern kingdom, he sends his wife in disguise to the prophet and he asks the prophet to see into the future and tell him what's going to be happen, but he assumes the prophet won't see through the disguise. All right? Again, we laugh, but let's just take a breath. <laughs> Can I ask you this? Do you believe in a God who is supernatural, who knows everything, and he is everywhere at once? Do you believe that? Yes, I do too. But do you have sin in your life that you're keeping hidden and you're pretending that it's not there? I do. Who do we think we're fooling? It can't be God. We're fooling other people. We're probably even fooling ourselves that somehow hiding it makes a difference. Why am I wanting to deceive other people around me as if their view matters when I know the truth and God knows the truth? Whose view really matters? And so we see Naaman and Gehazi both are judged by God on not their nationality, not even their good theology, not on their popularity, not on their standing amongst others. They're simply judged on one thing, the surrender of their heart to God. God knows their heart. God knows my heart. God knows your heart. God knows every heart without exception. You know, you and I are born with a condition that we cannot cure. And I'm going to call the rest of the music team up. We are born with a condition that we cannot cure. It is a proud and a sinful heart. It's a heart that wants to reject God's authority and when we want to rule ourselves. And when we get given challenges, we think they're all my own. And when we get credit, we think that is all our own. The Bible calls it sin. And the Bible says that it leads to death. And in the same way that Naaman could not cure himself, you and I cannot cure ourselves. There is only one way to be healed, and that is to humbly accept the fact that Jesus is the one who did what you and I could not do. He paid the penalty for that sin. We can't come with anything to exchange you can't come before God and say, God, I'll do this if you will save me. Or I think I've done something now. Now I'm ready to come. You can't pay for it. Not in advance and not in arrears. The good news and the bad news, both, is that you can bring nothing. It is so humbling, but it is just plain true. God knows your heart, so nothing is hidden. God calls your heart. No one is excluded. If you think you are excluded, you're not. If you think that person in your life is excluded, they are not. God wants to humble your heart and to realise that none of us deserve it, but the call is there. And the right response is not payment. The right response is worship. And we're going to do that in song. Worship is not just song. But that is our opportunity now. So let's join together in worship.